Hi, welcome back to Bexhill West. In this episode, I'm going to complete the build of this engine shed and show you how I fitted the lighting into the inspection pits. Welcome back, I'm James. So, as you may well know, uh, I've been building an engine shed for Paul Apps uh, and his Sandling Junction model railway. Now, we, I visited Paul probably a couple of months ago now, and we sort of did a test fit and it was all kind of fine. And really I've just been waiting on an opportunity to go back and, and, and do the final handover. And of course in that time there was a few jobs still to do, which of course I've left till the last minute. But as I'm seeing him next week, it's time really to get this thing finished off. And there's a few detail changes that I'll run through a little bit later on. But really the focus for today is to install the lighting into the inspection pits. And I'll show you how I've done it. Now, I'm not saying it's the right way to do it or the only way by any means. Um, however, there were a few challenges with this particular project, which has led me to go down a particular route. And I hope it's of interest to some of you. Let's get into it. Now I'll do an overview of the whole build towards the end of the video, but for now let's just have a quick look at these inspection pits. Now Paul supplied me with the, um, the Pico inspection pits to, that he wanted used for the build, and you can see here I've fitted one of them up with the lights. Now if this were my model I'd want to, to paint these first um, and kind of fit them in finally before fitting the lights, however I'm not sure what Paul wants to do paint-wise. Um, and I've actually run out of track, so I can't put the track in either. Um, so really I think it's best that at this stage these units are removable with the lights on. Uh, and, and that presents some challenges as to how I go about that. So what we'll do is I'll flip the model over, I'll show you from the underside how I've rigged the, this side up, and then we'll take you step by step through the process that I've used. So this is the model from the underside and hopefully you can see here we've got the, the bottom of the Pico inspection pit sort of unit pushed through the floor of the model. And if we have a look on this um, lower section you can see that I've incorporated into the base little cutouts where the LEDs will sit. Now I detailed all of this in a previous video which I'll, I'll, I'll stick a link to up in the, the corner of the screen. So what I've done is I've made a little jig and I've drilled holes, two millimeter diameter holes for the LEDs through the side of the inspection pit. And this gets dropped in from the top so that this top surface finishes flush with the top surface of the floor in the engine shed. And the idea being quite simple that the LEDs, if I show you with this one here, hopefully the camera will pick that up, that will sit in through the little notch in the floor and project into the side of the inspection pit. So if we look at the top here, I've used a piece of self-adhesive copper track which I stuck to the underside of the pit and that is uh, the conductor for the sort of the negative um, leg for each of the LEDs so they're all soldered onto that. And then the positives are taken off in the form of a loom which extends down to one end of the shed. Turning our attention now to the other end of the model you can see that the loom comes down and terminates into this little electronic control unit here. Now what this enables me to do is to connect the LEDs directly. It has a transformer built in, so there's no need for resistors and, and what have you here. Um, and it has a really great feature whereby if I stick a screwdriver in here we can adjust the sort of the brightness of those LEDs. Now that can be a bit of a um, a bit of a faff selecting the right resistor value to achieve the effects that you're after. Um, but with this it's quite simple. So what I wanted to do was provide Paul with something that was really simple to operate, really easy to interface with, and all he'll need to do to remove these pits is just undo the screws, remove the loom, uh, the pit unit can come out, it can be painted and weathered and whatever he wants to do, um, and then insert it back in and the wires can just connect up again really quickly. Now I haven't finished lacing this all together yet and I'll, I'll do that when the whole thing is finished. But what we'll do now is get the second 
um, inspection pit and I'll show you the process I use to put this loom together. I mean it's, it's not rocket science but I hope that that's going to give the flexibility Paul needs to take it apart and adapt and, and what have you. Now something that's worth mentioning, and I'll talk a bit more about this later on, is that there's plenty of additional um, connectivity here. Paul could add loads more lights to his model or even run uh, the, the lights to, to other models on his layout. And these units will daisy chain together. So you could have one master switch control the whole thing. Anyway, that's it for now. Let's, let's get on with doing the, the second inspection pit. So then the first step of this process is to apply the self-adhesive copper tape. Now I'll put a link to this in the description. If you've not used it before it's really helpful for jobs like this um, where we want to reduce the bulk and of having lots and lots of wires. Now it has its limitations and it's, it's by no means a, a perfect product in all situations. In fact I used to hate it for some reasons which I'll describe in a minute um, but it does work quite well and I couldn't think of a better way of solving this problem on, on this particular job so that's why I'm using it. Now I'll just, there's one of the problems, it rolls up, there we go, let's stick that on there. Not the neatest job but that will do. Okay so the next thing just come to the LEDs and let's focus on this. I hope you can see that I've pre-bent the leg of the LED so that it will fit nicely and what we'll do is just bring the focus back in. There we go. These will now push in through the sides through those holes that were previously drilled and I should be able to insert these along the length of the pit. Now when I did the other side I did one by one and it all seemed to take forever, it became quite tedious. So what I've done now is try to prepare my materials in advance, get bits and pieces pre-bent just to save me a bit of time and work a bit more efficiently. So they will push in. One of the great advantages of soldering them directly to the tape on uh, the pit itself is that they'll become quite secure so I won't need to glue these in they'll kind of just naturally be held so they insert something like that let's see a couple more to do that one there oh and I'm one short so let's bend up another one so I identify the negative leg, or I suppose I should say the cathode. We'll just put a straight 90 degree bend in it there. And then using my rather oversized pliers, not really ideal for this job. I'll bend that back on itself through 90 degrees, something like that. And then that can push straight in. Okay, so what we'll do now is solder these into place. Now a word or two about soldering. I pulled this wheel of solder out, you know, wheels of solder all over the place, and I noticed that it's a little bit crusty. It's been kicking around for years. So something that I like to do um, is I just get a bit of solvent and just give my solder a wipe over. Now I have cleaned this one previously, so I don't suppose we're going to notice much difference. Um, well, we can maybe see a little bit of dirt on there. But when I cleaned this the first time round, it was this was black. So it's definitely worth cleaning your solder if you've not used it for a while. Um, it just helps make a better job. I taught electronics for many years, and in almost all cases of failure, a project wouldn't work. Um, it was always down to a dry joint or a poorly executed soldered joint, and and I think just cleanliness is is the first step in eliminating a lot of those issues. So I've got my soldering iron here. Quick wipe off on a, a damp sponge. We want the tip nice and clean. And what I'm going to do is just solder these things into place, which won't take very long at all.
There we go, there's the first one. Now one of the criticisms that I have of this self-adhesive copper tape is that the action of soldering to it heats up and softens the adhesive that holds it into place and so very often it can lift and, and not stick very well um, which can be a problem so what I'll probably do when this project is complete is I'll just run along here with a few little dots of super glue over the edges of the copper tape just to prevent it from lifting and that seems to work fine now obviously I'm soldering onto what is a plastic moulding so if I overheat these joints, I'm going to melt the plastic. So we need to be a little bit mindful of that. Um, but I mean, we shouldn't be overheating these, you know, relatively sensitive components anyway. So it's perfectly fine, provided you execute your soldering quickly and, and cleanly, which is another good reason for having a clean tip on your soldering iron. There we go, so that's the, all the LEDs are now in place and they're not going to fall out. We can turn it over and we can see what we've done. That's okay, pretty good. So my next task will be to come in here and trim away the excessive ends, these negative legs of the, uh, of the LEDs. So I'm just going to use my track cutters for that because they'll get in there, do a pretty neat job, make sure I cut the right side of the leg. much easier to do this when you're not filming yourself doing it. There we go. Now take care if you attempt this yourself because yesterday I cut the wrong side of the um, the leg. I, I cut the LED off of the soldered joint. If you like, that was a bit that was a bit daft. Oh, and I can see I've missed an LED out, so I'll have to pop that one in in just a second. There we go. So for the next stage of this process, I'm going to bend all of the positive legs up. And what I found worked quite well yesterday, so I just bend them up and inwards, and you'll see why in a minute, why that's a helpful thing to do. So I'll bend those over something like that. Just doing that quickly. And then what we want to do is insulate these legs so that they, they don't touch each other and there's no risk of things shorting out. And so for that I've stripped some insulation off of some slightly bigger cable. Let's just have a look at that. And that's, um, that's what we're going to use to, to insulate these legs. So I'm just going to chop off little bits and slide them down over those positive legs or those anodes if you like for the LEDs. So quite straightforward, quite simple, quite quick. I'm going to chop a bit off of this one. Okay so I'll finish that off and then we'll get into the next task. So the next task is to tin the ends of the cables that I'm going to use to connect the LEDs and this is how I prefer to do it. I, I like to strip the end of the wire and I'm using my track cutters here rather than my wire strippers which are just out of reach. Would you believe it's on camera and I can't do it. I did this dozens of, oh there we go, right dozens of times yesterday without a hitch. So there we go I just like to just 
strip it and pull it back a whisker. Obviously a proper cable stripping tool is much better. And then I twist the insulation as I slide it off of the end of the wire. And that leaves nicely twisted wires, which I hope the camera's picked up. That's, that's nice and neat. So we can tin those now. So a simple job. And we get something nice and neat. What I'll do is I'll run along and tin all of the LED legs whilst I've got the soldering iron out and I'll do this all in one go. It's, uh, it will save time in the long run. Now you can't see the window I've got open next to me and I'm wearing my face mask. But you can see all of the smoke coming off of there. Now I am using leaded solder just because I prefer it to lead free but the usual sort of safety rules do apply. Take care with anything that's producing fumes and what have you that's going to be harmful to you. Okay, so there's one end of the wire stripped. I won't bother stripping the other end just yet. Let's get that on the camera. So I've got one end done, one end not done. And uh, let's fit these wires up. So I've soldered my first wire on. And what I'm going to do is slide some heat shrink tubing over that joint. Now really I should be using heat shrink of a slightly smaller diameter. This is a bit big really, but it's all I've got to hand at the moment, so it's, it's going to have to do. But what I'm going to do is just slide that over there. And again, I should be using a proper heat gun for this, but I don't know where my heat gun's gone. So I'm going to use a, a flame just to shrink there. Now this is not the right way to do it because it sometimes chars, but there you go. So that's got that done. And what we could do now is just bend this round and I want it to follow a line more or less down the centre of the inspection pit looking from underneath. And now we can move on and do the next one and the next one and so on. When I get to put the second one on, I'll show you a little trick I'm going to do, which is going to help keep this loom neat and tidy. So I've got my first two LEDs done now, and the heat shrink is ensuring that like, I'm not going to get any short circuits. But what I've done is I've got a, an, another piece of heat shrink, which I slid down the cable, and I'm going to slide this around those two wires I've put in and over this piece I've put here. And now when I shrink this down, this is going to help hold this loom together. And if I repeat that process every time I connect another LED to this loom, this loom is going to end up being really rigid and I won't need to glue it in. It's just going to kind of hold itself in place. So let's, this is very difficult to do for the camera. I should do my best, get my little lighter. There we go, and you can see the outcome, that's, that's pretty good, I'm pleased with that. So I won't bore you with doing each and every LED, but I'll do a run and then next time we get to an interesting bit I'll stop and, uh, and, and show you what I've been doing. So I'm about 15 minutes into this project now, and you can sort of see how this is working. We've got the um, heat shrink here, and then this is the the bit I've just shown you, tying it together. And then again, when the third one was introduced to the loom, the sleeving over the wires here, and again with the fourth and the fifth. And that all works to tie this together nicely. That loom's not going anywhere. It could possibly be, I don't know, glued down maybe, but it doesn't need it. This is all very robust. Now I find that using the heat shrink that I've got here, which I think is three mil or something like that, 3.2 millimeters. I think it's an imperial eighth of an inch size. I find that I can only actually get about five cables in. That's my maximum. So when I introduce the, the sixth LED into the loom, I will leave one of the cables out 
so that I still have five cables in the loom and one out of the loom, if that makes sense. And then when I get to the seventh LED, I will incorporate this wire um, and leave two wires out of the loom. But I'll make them a different wire to the wire that I left out of the loom here, so that the loom stays all tied together. That's probably confusing. I'll do it and then show you what I've done when I've finished. Now you can see here why I suggested bending these um, longer legs so that they went inwards. I'm able to run all the cables between them and it sort of holds the cables in place as I'm working. Um, now each one will get bent down just as I've shown you previously. But for the time being all these cables are kept together and the bench isn't being swamped with wires all over the place which can be stressful and which doesn't lead to good quality work. And so we've reached the end of this particular job now. That lacing of the wires continues along. Now you can see here where the wires, the bundle of wires if you like, becomes too big for the heat shrink that I've got. Now ideally I'd have some larger diameter heat shrink and I'd be able to incorporate all of these wires into a, a heat shrunk bundle. However, by leaving an odd wire out and then reincorporating it where I've next got some heat shrink, the overall effect is quite neat and tidy. And then these wires will come out to the end. These will be tinned and installed into the electronic gizmo I showed you before. And so this is the final installation. I've run these wires out. They're running underneath the board and are connected to this set of terminals here. The top pit, as you can see, it all connected there. I've still got a little bit of tidying up to do and I'll, I'll tidy some of this up and I've, I've done a terrible thing here. I've connected my a sort of common um, negative, if you like, to the board using a red wire. Well, that will never do. I, just cut corners really, I couldn't be bothered to go and get the black wire, but I think that will that'll upset me, so I'll, I'll probably change that out in a bit. Um, I just wanted to get it up and running for testing. This, I think I've probably done a better job here than I've done with the top one, so I'll tidy all these wires up. But you can see how easy it is to connect to here, so I've not had to worry about resistors, I've got that flexibility of adjusting the intensity of the light, so that's quite nice. Now this will run on a voltage I think from something like 3 to 24 volts so there's some flexibility there with the power supply that Paul would like to use. Now this red piece here is a little um, jumper plug, we can pull that off and that will reveal two pins to which wires can be soldered to for a remote switch to switch this device on and off. Um, remotely and I think maybe this might be a nice idea to connect a DCC um, operated relay to so that Paul could turn this on and off um, from his train controller. We can bring the input power here there's a two and a half millimeter input jack so we could use a, a, a sort of a ready-made if you like power supply or we can run the power into this screw connector here or there's pins for power supply here. We can take our power supply out and daisy chain this if we wish to a, a second of these units um, which will kind of run as a slave of this one. Now there's a little switch on here and we can, we can change um, the position of this switch to give us either a, a 12 volt um, output um, or slid as I've got it here 3 volt so we can either connect the LEDs directly to this setup or if we had it running at 12 volts then obviously we'd put resistors in. But that shows basically how I've connected all the wires up and you can see all the options here for connecting um, to, this, to this differently. What I could do and what I might still do, the board came supplied with the plugs that will plug into these fittings here. So I may well even bring these down into little pairs and, and plug them in um, here, that might be easier for Paul. However, I quite like doing it this way because it meant the wires were sort of held below the surface of this, so he's not going to have a lot of stuff sticking out the bottom of his baseboards. Anyway, there you go, that's the little unit. Incidentally, I, I got this board um, off of Amazon, I'll put a link in the description down below and uh, you can check that out if you're interested. 
And so there you have it, that completes the installation of the lights in the engine shed. Now I said at the start of the video that I'd get the whole build completed. Well, I will do, but I think that's going to make this video rather too long. And as the lights themselves made a nice little subject, we'll leave the video there for now. If you've got any comments, then please do leave them down below and I'd love to hear from you. So until next time, thanks for watching everyone. Bye bye.